Well, it's great to see all of you here today. How many of you are glad to be here? How many of you are not glad to be here? Well, if that's the case, hopefully by the end of the day, you'll say I was glad. Wow, man, what a song. Does it just blow you away that God chose to love us? Amen. That he chose to love us? I mean, and I can't help but think, as I sing that song, all the times that I fail him, and yet he still loves me. And, and the songs that we sang today were geared around this idea of love, because for the third time in this series, through the study of 1 John, we're going to be talking about love. Again, the third time in this short little book, only five chapters, and, the, and one of the predominant themes in this book is love. And we have to ask ourselves the question, why? We're going we're gonna to answer that question. But let's think about love for a minute. I mean, when we think about love, certain things usually pop into our mind. Maybe something like this, right? See, everybody's saying, oh. We think about love, we think about that. And, 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 and love is a grand thing, right? In that sense, sometimes we, we may even think of images like this. We think about love, and we think about these ideas of love, and then ultimately we may even think, well, you know, yeah, it's, it's cute to see two little kids showing affection, and it's great to see a young couple married. But many times when we think about love, we, we might even think about this image. Two people that have gone through life together, right? And, and they're still together, and they're, they've got the battle scars to prove it, and they're still together, and they actually look like they still enjoy each other's company. As we know, there's some couples out there that don't look like they enjoy each other's company anymore, right? And we, we can just talk a lot about love, and we can do a whole sermon on, on love and the family, and we'll do a series on that later on. But many times when we think about love, we think about these kind of images. But John's going to talk about something that's a little different than these images. It, it does does take a part of these images and add it to it, but we all know that these images of love also can represent faults and failures, right? We all know that in relationships, sometimes when we say we love the other person, we can be very selfish, right? Sometimes we can say, well, you don't love me because if you love me, you would treat me this certain way. We can think about these ideas of love. We can even think about love within a family. Love that parents have for their children and vice versa. Uh, love that a husband and wife share together. Love that fathers and, and, and their sons and daughters have and mothers and their sons and daughters have. And we all know and realize that sometimes that love is not always loving, is it? Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's selfish. Sometimes it's deceitful. Sometimes it's manipulative, isn't it? And after all, we would then say, well, that really isn't love. So the question is, what is love? What is love? We've all had that conversation. I've sat down with people of all ages, and they just say, I'm in love with this person. And I would ask them, well, what is love? Have you ever tried to answer that question? Some that have said they've loved people for their entire life struggle sometimes with this answer. What is love? Today in our text, John's going to tell us what love is. The Bible's going to clearly define what love is. And it's going to show us some things that may challenge us in our Christian life. That may challenge us in our devotion to God. That may challenge us in the fear that we have in our life. But I hope that we'll all walk away from this passage changed. Because this is an important topic in the book of 1 John. Like I said, in five chapters, this is the third time we're going to talk about it. Let's do a little refresher real quick. And this has to do with love as well. As we started in 1 John 1, 4, as he's attacking these false teachers, saying, look, Jesus was the real thing. We saw him, we heard him, we touched him. He was for real. And we're telling you this so that you may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We're writing these things so that our joy may be complete. And all of this, this sets the stage for the rest of the book. It's talking about fellowship. We know that. When it comes to understanding true love, real love, it is contingent upon our fellowship with God. 
I hope that when we get through this series, we will all walk away. And some of you may even be saying, I am sick and tired of hearing fellowship every time we come to church. Some of you may be saying that. If you're saying that, that means I've done my job. Because we need to realize that fellowship is essential. Not just fellowship with each other. That's important. It's essential. But more importantly, our fellowship on a daily basis with God. It is essential to victory in your Christian life. If you're here today and you don't know if you're a Christian, we're going to talk a little bit about that as well in this sermon. The three things John continually points out is that we have the forgiveness of sins. This is going to be emphasized in today's sermon as well. We also have an available intimacy with God and with each other. That's that fellowship that's available. It's there. All we have to do is tap into it. And then the strength of the Word of God. We talked about that last week when I asked you the question, how can we keep the commands of God if we don't even know them? How can we discern what's right and wrong through the Holy Spirit when the Bible is His sword? If we don't know it, we cannot discern. So today, this is what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the next level and the next level capacity. wanted to add other words to this, but I wanted to keep it nice and short so you can really grab a hold of this. Today, we're going to emphasize the capacity to love. We're going to even talk about another, a whole next level of love altogether. A next level capacity for what? Perfect love. Now how many of you would say you have perfect love for your family? That means that every single moment of every single day, you're only constantly thinking about them and showing love and, and uh, devotion to them and showing that perfect. How many of us would say that we have perfect love for God? That means that every moment of your life, every thought that goes in your mind, every decision that you make is devoted first and foremost to loving God. And you're looking at a preacher that can't raise his hand on either one of those questions. Because there's times that Jeff loves Jeff more than he does his family. There's times that I love Jeff more than I love God. And I hope I'm not in the, only, the only one in the boat. Right? Let's not be pious, right? We struggle with these things because we're human. So when we talk about a perfect love, we're going to spend some time defining what a perfect love is. And this is not just a word I came up with. You're going to see this word in the text today. It sets the stage for what we're going to talk about. The capacity that there is there is this ability for us to tap into what we're going to talk about, this perfect love, and that there is a next level capacity within us to have this love and to display this love. That's what we're going to be talking about in the text today. So I hope you'll stay with me. The very first thing we must do is understand that this love is determined. It's a determined love. Let's start in 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 7. We're going to go through, and, and I hope that you'll buckle in, because I don't want to keep you as long as I did last week. Although it was first Sunday, we had a lot of things going on. That's, that's it. You can laugh at that. I got an excuse there. But I'm okay. We're going to cover somewhere around 15, 16 verses today. Now, I know some of you are like, oh, man. I usually only cover around six. <laughs> So we're going to fly today and we're going to be skimming across the surface and we're going to be hitting some deep stuff and trying to, to figure that out along the way. So we're going to go through uh, verses 7 through 21 of 1 John chapter 4. That's where we're going to be parked today. So if you want to open up your Bibles, you want to look on the screen, they're going to be there. Let's get busy doing some serious work looking at what the Word of God says because that's what we're here for, right? We're here to worship God and learn about how to be closer to Him. We're going to talk about a love that is determined. Starting in verse 7, John writes this, Dear friends, and he starts off by saying, Let us love one another. He brings this emphasis up again. Let us love one another because love is from who? God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love, uh, does, not love does not know God because God is love. He starts off by saying, let us love one another. We, this is synonymous with the Gospel of John and with throughout the New Testament. And Jesus had this thought on his mind that we that follow him should love one another. Matter of fact, we've said this before. In the early teachings in the New Testament, there was two predominant doctrines 
that was being taught by Jesus consistently. Matter of fact, in Matthew and in Mark, he said all of the commandments could be summed up in two things. Think about that. All the commandments, not just the Ten Commandments, but all of the 633 commandments that were added later, every one of them could be summarized in two statements. If you were to look at the Ten Commandments, every commandment in the Ten Commandments deals with these two statements. And the two statements Jesus said it could be summarized in was what? Love God with all your strength, might, and heart, and love who else? Your neighbor as yourself. Everything could be summed up with love God and love others. The commandments deal with that. Thou shalt not steal. If you steal some, from someone, are you loving God and loving your neighbor? Right? Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet your neighbor's wife or his possessions. All those, all ten of those commandments, if broken, affect and display your lack of love for God or others or both. So Jesus is summarizing the entire Old Testament saying, look, Love God, love others. If you were around in the early New Testament churches, you would have heard that taught consistently and not just taught, but practiced. Practiced. The early churches loved one another. Did they have failures and problems? Yes, they did. But we see predominantly throughout the pages of the New Testament that these people loved each other. Love one another. Look what else he says. When we talk about it being determined, it's love is brought by a, a determinant. And that would be this. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. And the reason why is underlined at the bottom of that verse is God is love. God determines what love is. Did you hear that? I want you to get this. Some of, some of you, you're in relationships. Some of you are going to be in relationships. Some of you are past relationships. Maybe you're broken or hurt or whatever the case may be. Some of you have uh, broken relationships in your family. Some of you may have broken relationships with friends. Here's the deal. We are very guilty oftentimes of trying to be the determiner of what love is, aren't we? We can be very guilty of saying this is what love is. How could you say you love me if you do this? Or if you love me, you will treat me a certain way. And if the way you treat me doesn't agree with what I think, then I say you don't love me. And we have just made ourselves the determinant, right? But the Bible says here, it's not the case. God is love. If you want to know what love is, I mean real love, you look to God. Are you getting that this morning? Some of you young people need to gravitate towards that. As you get closer and closer to finding Mr. or Mrs. Wright, as you start looking at marriage and all these different things, dating, you should look at the way you de define and determine love. And you need to compare it with what God says is love. Look what he says. He says, everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Remember, what's the book of 1 John about? What's it about? We just talked about it. Fellowship, right? If you're not careful when you read these passages, you will see and you will think, well, if people aren't loving other people, they must not be saved. That's not what this verse is saying, is it? Because I'm telling you right now, you can know Jesus Christ as your Savior and still be an unloving person. Because your salvation is not based on your ability to be a loving person. You have the flesh, you're wrapped around in the flesh. I'm, I hate to tell you, but there's going to be times you're selfish. There's going to be times you're hateful. There's going to be times you treat people wrong. Does that mean, make it right and justified? No, it means you need to get that taken care of, but you need to focus on your fellowship with God. Look at the, the words he uses. Everyone who loves has been first, what? Born of God. Now, he is talking about a perfect love that we're going to be explaining. What he's talking about is a love that's described in the Greek as agape love. This is a love that is a spiritual love. It is a love that comes from God. There are other forms of love in the Greek we're, we're familiar with, uh, such as phileo. It's where the, the term Philadelphia comes from, the city of brotherly love, right? It, it's, it's, it's this emotional love. But the problem with phileo love only is it's a give and get situation. Matter of fact, it says, 
basically in its meaning, I will love you and I will give things to you because I love you, but you're to give things back to me for that love. That's what phileo love is. There's another Greek word called eros. And we're familiar with eros because it is a sensual, physical love. Okay? And it is all about getting. Not so much about giving. The, now, these there's three ways that are defined in love. Eros, phileo, and agape. The problem is, so many times we fail to realize agape love and we try to fill our loves up with just one or a combination of both of the other. The problem with that is, in both of those forms of love, it's about you getting something. Agape love is all about giving. And giving the best. And agape love is only attainable through God. It is what the Bible declares God's love. So what does this mean? This means, and I want you to get this. For those that are not believers, they cannot exhibit agape love. Because it's a love that comes from knowing God. We as believers can exhibit and display agape love, but there's times in our life where we don't because we get wrapped up in ourselves or we're not in fellowship with God. When he says everyone who loves, you may be saying, Jeff, how can you say that non-believers can't exhibit agape love? Well, the first stipulation is they must be born of God. That phrase is talking about salvation. For you to ever have the opportunity to have the capacity a next level capacity for agape love, you must first be saved. You must first be a believer. But it doesn't stop there. Look what it says. And what? Knows. knows God. The word knows there, and I'm sorry for all the Greek today, but we got to understand these things, is gnosko. If you remember when we first started this series, we determined that the word know, gnosko, is, is referring to a, a present perfect a participle in the Greek that means that there came a knowledge of at one point in your life and then from there on out there's been a growing knowledge because of that event that happened. Do you, do you understand that? Remember when we talked about that? There was a time you came to know Jesus and you were saved but now as years go we're to be gnoscoing him more. We're to be getting to know him more. Just like when you first met your spouse you knew them but now, after years go by, you should know them more than when you got married. Does that make sense? That's what he's talking about. For us to distribute, everyone who loves, when, if we're displaying the agape love of God, we must first know God as Savior through Jesus Christ, and through our fellowship with Him, we're displaying this love. And he goes on and says, the one who does not love, look what he says, does not know God. That, look, what did he exclude there? He didn't say the one who does not love is not born of God. Does it say that? But remember, 1 John is written to believers. This is why it's important for us to fight for that attention, to learn these things. He's not saying if you don't love, you're not saved. Obviously, those that are not saved can't have this love, but he's writing to believers. And he's saying if you're not displaying this determined love of God, there is something wrong in your fellowship with God. That's what he says. The one who does not love does not gnosko God. Does that make sense? You're not getting to know God. Why? Because God is love. You know what that means? If God is the determinant of love, the more we get to know him, what's going to display through us is love. So if you're going around and treating people in ways that they shouldn't be treated, you're holding grudges, you're not forgiving them, you're saying bad things either to their face or behind their back, you're, you're avoiding them, you're running them down in the dirt, you're being rude to them, you are showing everybody that you have not been fellowshipping with God. That's what he said. We got it? If you're good, say amen. All right, good. Yeah, man, we got a good amen. Keep that going, right? So love determined, it's determined by God. It is not manufactured by us, not this agape love. It is determined by God. Let's look on to the next thing we can learn about love. What is love defined? Okay, we see that God determines love and he is love, but what is that love? How is love defined? Let's move on as we continue in our, in our verses here. Look what it says. 
God's love, so he's going to tell us what about God's love, was revealed among us in this way. He's going to define what love from God is. God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. You want to know what the love of God looks like? Look at the cross. Look at the cross. He goes on to explain this better. Look what he says. Love consists in this. Get this. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be this big theological word, the propitiation. Everybody look at your neighbor and say, propitiation. You just, you, now you can sound like a Greek scholar. Not good. For our sins. What does the love of God look like? We look at the cross of Jesus Christ. We see Jesus hanging, broken, bleeding. And we realize that he's the propitiation. The word propiti propitiation means this. The atoning substitutionary sacrifice. Matter of fact, some people even say substitutionary is not a good word. word but it is for sure the atoning sacrifice. What that meant was Jesus went to that cross to satisfy our sin debt against God. That we committed sin against God and there's no way we can fix it and Jesus went to the cross to pay for our sin. That is love according to God. You know what that agape love is displaying is God did the best for us not just the best he could do, but the best thing for us, even though we didn't know we needed it at the time. He laid down his son's life for us. You know, parents love their children, or they should. They should. They don't always like their children, by the way, right, parents? But they should love their children. But a parent's love is not a perfect love in every sense. And what I mean by this is, if someone, most parents would agree, if someone broke into your house, I know if someone broke into my house, before they get to my kids, you're going to have to go over to my dead body. Right? Would you agree, parents? You're like, yeah, they'd have to go over your dead body, Pastor. Yeah. <laughs> but what if I was in the presence of someone who despised me? Someone who hated me. Someone who was my enemy. What if you were in the presence of someone who was your worst enemy and someone was threatening their life? Would you stand in the gap? We all remember 9-11. A lot of us do, most of us do, except for those that are really young. I always use this illustration when I'm talking about the gospel because it's a powerful one. We send soldiers. We have soldiers in our auditorium today, and we're so thankful for their service. But what if we were to send our soldiers over to the Middle East and say, you're going to have to protect Osama bin Laden and keep him alive and be willing to lay your life down for this? How many soldiers do you think would do that? How many of you would do that? Come on, don't, don't be you know, religious here. How many of you would go lay down your life for Osama bin Laden after 9-11? Why wouldn't you? Because he was the enemy of our country, right? He took lives. He declared war on our country. But that is the very thing Jesus did for us. You see, Romans tells us that we were the enemies of in Romans chapter 8, it says that even for some time, and some people may even for a good cause lay down their life for someone. Parents may die for their children. And some may even be bold enough or courageous enough to, to go and lay down their life for a good cause like our soldiers do when they go and they fight overseas to protect our freedom. They lay down their life for us. It's like what policemen and firefighters do and all those things. They lay down their life for good causes. But rarely would one die for their enemies. Yet that's what you do. We were enemies against God. We didn't love God. As, as Romans chapter 3 tells us, as it is written, there are none that seek God. There are none that seek righteousness or do right. We want to be our own God. 
those people in, in the time when Jesus died, they, they, they blindfolded him and they slapped him and they spit in his face and they ripped his beard out by the handfuls and they nailed the crown of thorns into his head. And they mocked him and they put him on a cross and people walked by as, as the psalmist said that they were shaking their heads at him in disgust and they were mocking him and they plunged a spear into his side. The perfect man with nothing but perfect love and they nailed him to a cross. And at any time he could have just come off that cross and annihilated everyone, but his love kept him on the cross. That's perfect love. What John is telling us as believers, we have the capacity to love like Jesus did. We have that capacity. It's a next level capacity. It's a love that would infect this world in one of two ways. Either they would be attracted to it or they would despise it. Just like they despise Jesus. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, that love was displayed for you. He hung on that cross for you. To change you. To change your life. And we have the capacity because He loved us. Not because we loved Him, but He loved us first. That's love defined. So the next sign, especially you young people... When Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright says, I love you, why don't you challenge what they mean by that? Right? I always refer to this illustration. You'll, you'll probably hear it through me. You used to always aggravate me growing up with preachers would use the same illustrations, and I find myself doing it more and more. But this young guy was writing a love letter. I know for you young people, let me put it this way. He was sending a love text, I guess. <laughs> he was writing a, a love letter to his girlfriend saying, Oh, sweetheart, I love you so much. I would climb the highest mountain for you. I would swim the deepest ocean. I would cross the widest river. I would go through the driest desert. I would, I would go through the, the biggest storm for you. P.S. I'll see you Saturday if it doesn't rain. Hope that's the end. So many times we have love like that. So many times we have love like that. People will say things to you. If you love me, you would do this. Let me let me just talk to you for a second about that. And this wasn't in my notes, but just as a father, I have to address it. If someone ever says, if you love me, you would do this for me, I want you to understand what they're saying. And this is the way I want you to hear it, young people especially. What they're saying is, I don't love you. Did you hear that? If someone says, if you love me, you would do this for me, they're saying, I don't love you. Because they're only thinking about themselves. Many young people fall into that trap and they feel guilty and they end up making mistakes and doing things that they know they shouldn't because they feel like, I don't, I'm not loving this person. I'm not being, no, that person is not loving you. You need to just get up and walk away. Jesus Christ looked at those who were enemies and he said, I will die for them because I love them. That's love. That's love. Love defined. Let's look at love displayed. This perfect love, this capacity that we have, love displayed. He goes on, he says this, dear friends, if God loved us in this way, in what way did he love us? Jesus laid down his life for us on the cross. If God loved us in this way, look what he says next. We also must love one another. Why? No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God remains in us and his love is what? Perfected. There's a couple of words we have to remember here. First of all, he makes the statement, no one has ever seen God. And no one is going to see God in this physical realm. If we were to see God, if God was to show up now, we would all die in his presence. Now, some people saw Jesus in the flesh, but we don't have that, do we? You're not going to see Jesus in the flesh until we're with him in eternity. So I want you to remember that. Why is he saying no one has ever seen God? And then look at the next thing. If we love one another, God remains in us. Remember that word remain? What's it talking about? Fellowship, not salvation. If we as the people of God love one another, you know what God does? God says, I'm going to move into that situation. Did you get that? 
He says, that's where I want to be. There's a lot of churches that I know that I've been a part of in my past and I hear about today where you can walk into their meeting place and God's not there because they don't love each other. There's a lot of places where people can go that these places are there to show the love of God, but when they go, they don't experience the love of God. I'm very happy for our church here because I think our church shows people that they love them. Would you agree with that? Now that's something we can't brag about because once we do that, we start moving into realms we don't want to. But it is an urgency for us that when anybody walks in that door, I want you to hear this, every single one of us have the responsibility that by the time they leave, they know this church loves them. That's not the case in every church, is it? Leanne and I, when we were on uh, sabbatical, we went to Branson, we were up there, we, we visited a church there on the Sunday that we were there. We're going to be in church. We went and visited a church. It was a large church. They had two services and probably about four to 500 in each service. And I say large, that's large for us. We can't even think about that right now, can we? We walked in the door. When we got to the door, someone handed us a bulletin. We walked in. We sat down. We went through the entire service. We left, and not one single person said anything to us. Portico, that better not ever be us. Amen? Amen, uh, amen right? Amen. That better not ever be us. I want when people walk in, they, they may not like our decor. They may not like the parking lot. You know, there's not much we can do about that. They may not like, you know, our children's ministry or whatever they may be. But one thing they should never be able to say is that that church was just unfriendly. They should walk out of here saying, man, that church was friendly and they showed love to us. Why? Why is that so important? Look what he says. If we love one another, God remains in us. If we love each other, now that's loving people who come in here, but guess what? We're a family and we must love one another. We have to show that love. I was told about today that one of the people who's, who's coming to our church in, in a month or two, they're going to need some serious help at their house getting some work done. And I hope our church will step out and say, hey, we'll help get that done. And I think we will. Right? I know there's people that aren't here today because uh, they, they have things going on at home. They, yesterday they were without air conditioning, and today they're waiting, hoping to get it fixed. Now, I kind of got on to them because they didn't let us know that. Like, hey, here's what I want you to understand. We can't help you if you don't let us know, right? And we can't help you maybe in every kind of way, but we can do what we can do. So we have to show love one to another. We have to be at that place where we share needs and, and with each other, that we can help one another. Why? Because the more we, and I want you to get this, the more we love one another, the more God's going to show up and be in the midst. I want you to get that. There's a lot of stuff I want to cover on that, and I just don't have time. There's, there's a verse in Matthew that is taken out of context every almost every time it's used. And it's when Jesus is referring to, uh, he, he says something along the lines in Matthew chapter uh, 18. He says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I will be in the midst. How many of you ever heard that? And every time people say, well, that's talking about a church service, or it's talking about when people are out in the street and there's two or three that are Christians and they come together. And when they meet together, God shows up. Let me share you something, and I hope that you won't just turn it on, but you'll go home and study it out. Context is king. Go home and read Matthew 18 and see what the context of that chapter is. We don't have time to do it today. What he's talking about is church government and, and especially how to handle offenses and conflict within a church. Jesus says something, when a brother offends you, you go to them only. You don't go spread gospel around. You go to that person and you say, you offended me. Can we make this right? If they say yes, you forgive them. That's the end of the story. If they say no, you go back and you get two or three other people. And you go back and you say, hey, can we make this right? And they say, yes, you forgive them. If not, no. Ultimately, it goes all the way to the church. And people don't want to talk about that, but that's what the Bible teaches. And then the church says, look, you've done wrong. You need to make this right. And if they say, yes, we forgive them. It's good. But if they say, no, we have to release them from membership of the church so that God can get a hold of their life so that they can be restored back into fellowship. That's what it's talking about. And then he ends by saying this, where two or three are gathered in my name. What he's talking about is if you're going to bring this accusation, there has to be two or three witnesses that agree upon it, and God shows up and agrees with that decision. Isn't that totally different than what you've heard it before? That's what he's talking about. We cannot just pick a verse out of a chapter and say, well, this is what it means. You have to take it in context, just like you would any other book. You wouldn't read Romeo and Juliet and take one stanza out of it and say, well, this is what it means. That'd be weird, wouldn't it? 
Juliet on the window saying, Romeo, Romeo, where for I Romeo? Well, that means that she's calling for her lost dog who went out in the woods. That's what, it would, that's what it's like. People do that with the Bible all the time. Don't, let's not do that. Let's be students of the word. Study to show that self-approved, right? We have to be students of that. When we take that in context, we understand that we have God within us. We have the Holy Spirit within us. Me and Kenny, we're believers. We have the Holy Spirit within us. If, if me and Kenny are together, God's with us. If I'm by myself in my closet praying, God's with me. God's with you wherever you are if you're a believer. Okay? But when we come together, he ought to be here big time. Amen? Amen? He ought to be here big time. When we're singing together, God ought to be... God's, the Bible says God inhabits the praises of his people. The more we praise God, the more he shows up. The more we love one another, the more God says, that's a place I feel comfortable being a part of. We have to remember that, church. And his love... He, he, God remains in us, and His love is perfected in us. Now, here's kind of the word play. Perfected is not what we think it is in our English vernacular. In Greek, it means complete, mature, or full to the brim. That's what it means. That means when God remains in us and we're in that fellowship with one another and fellowship with God, God's love is in us and filling up and overflowing. Now, don't you want to be at a church like that? Let's, let's continue to be that church. Not just on Sundays, but every day of the week. That's what we have to be. Now, let me, let me go on quick here. This is how we know, okay? How do we know about this love and remaining in Him? Look what he says. This is how we know that we remain in Him, in God, and God in us. What's that talking about? Sweet fellowship. This is how we know we have good fellowship. He has given assurance to us from His Spirit. Remember we talked about discerning, testing the spirits last week. Today, what we're saying is... The way we can know that we're having that good fellowship with Him is that His Spirit brings something about in us. If you look in Galatians chapter 5, near the end of the chapter, we won't go there today, it says that one of the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. Love. In other words, the fruit of the Spirit is this. When the Spirit is in us, and it is when we're believers, and we're fellowshipping with God, we're fellowshipping with each other, we're loving one another, and we're loving God, just like Jesus taught, love God, love people. When that happens, His Spirit just produces that agape love, and it just flows out of us. It's not some mystical thing, some magical thing. It's a thing that God says He will do. God remains in that. The Holy Spirit of God produces it, and we become loving people. Listen to me, and this is for every age group. I want everybody looking to listen. If you say you're a follower of God you've trusted Jesus Christ and you treat people like dirt, your fellowship is wrong. Doesn't mean you're not saved. I don't know if you're saved or not. If you fully trusted in Jesus Christ, you're saved. But if you're treating people like you don't love them, you're being mean, you're making fun of them, you're doing things to cause pain in their life, you are far away from God. You need to repent and come back to that's what you're doing. It's like a red flag in our life that shows us we're not where we should be with God. Look, he says, He has given assurance to us from His Spirit, and we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent His Son as the world's Savior. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in Him and He in God. This is for believers. God remains in Him. This is describing great fellowship and love that is displayed through us. Why is it so important? I didn't, I didn't clarify this enough. Why is it so important that we love one another? Remember he said a few verses back, the world, no one has seen God. Right? Remember when he said that? No one has ever seen God. You know how this world is going to see God? If we love him. You think this world is seeing that in us? If we love one another, can't, this world's not going to see Jesus in the flesh until he comes back. And then there's a lot of problems that go along with that. But right now, they're not going to see him in the flesh. God's not going to show up in a physical form at their doorstep. But if they can see us loving one another and loving others, they get a glimpse of the love of God. And that means sacrificial love. That means that we actually give up conveniences in our own life to show love to others. You know what? Here's one thing. We're, we're approaching uh, November, and that's our anniversary. 
We're going to be beginning our fifth year as a church, praise God, at the beginning of November. But you know what one of my big goals is, and I think this is something that God has laid on my heart, is that in this town, and in whatever town you live in, but primarily where this, where, where this area that Portico plants its footprint, I want it to be commonplace that if you were to go down to Walmart, you'd walk in and you'd see someone from our church praying with someone on the aisle. Or if you see somebody broke down on the side of the road, you see one of our church members pulled over helping them. Now, I know we have to have wisdom and stuff. But so many times we use that as an excuse, don't we? Now, I'm proud of someone. I don't know who it is. The other day I went to Walmart. I was wearing my I Love My Church shirt. And on the way out, the lady at the door said, hey, somebody else was wearing that shirt today. So whoever that was, it was a while back, a couple months ago. Whoever that was, good job. I don't know who it was. But you know what? I want this town and the surrounding areas to say, what is this Portico church that I keep hearing about? What is wrong with these people? They keep helping people. They keep praying with people. They keep loving people. And you know why that's important? So people will see God and His love in us. Not a biased love, not a prejudiced love, not a convenient love, but a sacrificial, unconditional love. That's how God loved us. That's love displayed. It's important. Now let's look at what another thing that perfect love does. Perfect love drives. Now what's this mean? This is something important. I want you to get it. Look at the next verse I'm going to put on the screen. Look what it says. And we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. Look what it says next. God is love, and the one who, rem in, who remains in love remains in God, and God, God remains in him. This this flourishing fellowship, and look what he says. Uh, let me go. Let me before I get there. I want to kind of give some background where I'm heading with this. With this idea of love drives. We have come to know and to believe that the love that God has for us, God is love. The one who remains in love remains in God, and God remains in Him. This I understanding of what the love of God really is, and the point that I want to make. It's going to sound weird here in just a second, but if you stay with me, here's what I want you to say. See, love drives out fear and fig leaves. What? I saw your faces. That's great. That's what I wanted you to do. Some of you aren't listening because you didn't make it. <laughs> love drives out fear and fig leaves and replaces it with faith and forgiveness. What's this talking about? And if I lost my mind, let me take you back to Genesis 1 through 3. You don't have to go there. I must summarize it. We know Genesis 1 through 3. God created everything. He created Adam and Eve. He put uh, Adam and Eve in a garden. He said, this is my garden, but you can tend it, you can enjoy it, you can live here, you can have whatever you want from any tree except one. So let's say there's 14,000 trees. Let's say there's 1,400 trees. I, I don't know how many trees were there. God says, all these trees except one. What happened? They look at the fruit. They heard what Satan said. God said, don't eat this because he knows, and if you do, you'll be like him. And what did that spike in their heart? Lust. To be like God. We haven't changed much yet. We still want to be the God of our life. Even though we know God, even as believers, we still struggle with being God of our own life. Or letting God be God. And what happens? They partake of the fruit, and right after that, God said, if you partake of it, you're going to die. And something changed in them. All of a sudden, God shows up in the cool of the evening, and he's coming to what? Fellowship with him. Right? This is something that, by the text, we get the understanding this was a common occurrence. God would show up, he'd walk with them, and he'd talk with them. Wouldn't that be amazing? It's talking about fellowship. But today, this time, there's something different. He shows up, and where are they at? What are they doing? Why are they hiding? Because why? They're scared of God. Just think about that for a minute. Adam and Eve had never experienced fear before. And now they're afraid of the very God that they would walk in the cool of the evening and talk. The one who formed them and breathed life into them. They're afraid of him. Why? Because they sinned. And here's what I want you to get. They sinned against God. And it brought guilt in their life. Guilt is a healthy thing. We're living in a day and time where everybody wants to tell you, no, guilt's not real. It's just this weird thing. 
you don't need to worry about guilt. Guilt is a healthy event in your life. It is, it is this warning sign that goes off that you've done something wrong. And they start feeling guilty, and then they made a bad decision. They decided that since we sinned, we know we did what God said not to do. Something changes because now, all of a sudden, they're hiding from God. God says, why are you hiding? And Adam's answer is, because we're naked. Now, was Adam naked before they took of the fruit? Why wasn't there a problem then? Because something changed. They realize that they're naked. And what did they do? They sewed fig leaves together. They tried to what? Hide their sin. You see, there's two options you have when it comes to sin. Because we're all going to sin at one time or another. When you sin, guilt is going to come into your life. And you need to be aware of that guilt because if you ignore it too long, your conscience can be seared, as the Bible says, and you stop feeling guilt. And what happens then is people will feel guilt and they can either choose to go to God or to go away from God. Adam and Eve chose literally to go away from God. And they chose to cover themselves and try to hide because they were fearful. Now you may not have fig leaves. Thank you, Lord, right? But what are your fig leaves in your life when you fall into sin? It's predominant in our country. I was, I was hearing a good friend of mine preach a message about this, and he brought up some good points. And he said, for some people, it's phobias. Now, there's, there's healthy phobias, for instance, you know. I've never met a good snake that wasn't a dead snake. Right? Some people are afraid of spiders. Some people are afraid of heights and all those things. But then there are some people who are afraid of um, things that are just odd, right? But, I mean, it's one thing to be afraid of spiders, but it's, it's another thing to be afraid to live in a house where one spider was, saw, was seen five years ago. But some people have those phobias. Phobias sometimes can be the result of sin and hiding it from God for so long that it becomes permanent fig leaves, or what it seems like permanent fig leaves to us. And an important action for a believer to do, and this is, this is stuff that you need to really listen to, Something that is real important for believers to do is to realize they need to look at themselves and they need to say, I'm wearing fig leaves. I need to go to God. But there's fear, right? I remember when I was a kid, I'd get home. My mom would be at home with us and I'd get in trouble at home. And she said, when your dad gets home, you ever had that, that statement made to you growing up? When your dad gets home, and I remember I would look at the clock and see what time it was, and I'd realize that my dad was almost home and I would go find a hiding place. And I was quiet the rest of the day hoping my mom would forget. And I would go hide, and I could hear my dad come in the door, and my mom's greeting him and stuff, and then eventually I'd hear, oh, by the way, Jeff did this, this, and that. And then I would hear my dad's footsteps walking around the house saying, boy, where are you at? Right? And I was hiding because I was afraid of the punishment that was going to come. And, I, and now, in, in what I'm going to show you, how much different it might have been, and I would have probably still been punished, but it would have been a different story, if I would have been at the door waiting for my dad. And when he walked in the door, I said, Dad, i got to tell you, I messed up today. I did wrong. I disrespected Mom. I know that I did wrong, and I deserve whatever punishment you're going to give me. Isn't there a difference in that? Look at, listen, in, in Genesis 3, God has to go looking for Adam. He already knew where Adam was, but he was ready for Adam to say something. And Adam said, I'm hiding because I'm naked. And God said, who told you you were naked? And he said, we disobeyed you. How different it would have been if Adam, when he took that fruit, would have said, God, forgive me. Forgive me. But he was afraid. Look what this next passage in 1 John 4, 17 says. In this love, what love? The agape love of God is perfected, full to the brim, mature, complete with us so that we may have confidence. What's the opposite of confidence? Fear, right? That we may have confidence in the day of judgment for we are as he is in this world. What's this talking about? He references the judgment. There's coming of judgment. He's talking to believers. This is not a judgment. I want you to hear this. No matter what you've been taught, this is not a judgment that he's referring where your good and bad is going to be weighed out and if you don't make the cut, 
you're sent to hell. He's talking to believers. There's a judgment for believers. Not to determine who goes to heaven or hell, but to determine whether or not you get gifts or lose, or get rewards or lose rewards. You're secure in heaven if you're a believer. Nothing changes that. But when you get there, we're going to stand before the Bama seat of Jesus, and he's going to say, let's look at what you did for me in your life. Oh, look, you did this. Here's your reward. Oh, you didn't do this. You don't get a reward. We may have confidence in the day of judgment, for we are as he is in the world. In other words, we're his representatives of his love, just like we read. Look what the next verse says. Say with me here. Look what it says. There is no what? Fear, Fear in what kind of love? The agape love of God. There is no fear. Instead, perfect love drives out. This is why I said love drives. Love drives out what? Fear. Because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears has not reached perfection in love. You're, you have not been fellowshipping with God to the point where his love fills you up to the brim. But the more you fellowship with God, guess what happens to your fear? That love drives, it pushes it away. Because you, if you're filling yourself up with the love of God by fellowshipping with Him, there's no room for fear. Isn't that amazing? Maybe you grew up in a church that was like, if you do this wrong, you do this wrong, you must not be saved. God's going to punish you. God's going to punish you. Listen, there are consequences for sin. But I'm telling you, if you're a believer, if you just come back to Jesus, if you just come back to God, and you start fellowshipping with Him, He'll take that fear out of your life because His love will fill you to the brim. Are you with me? And this is exciting stuff. I know we're talking about some stuff here. I know it's going a little longer than I wanted it to. But listen, don't let... listen. We give our attention to Netflix binge watching all the time. Please give our attention to the Word of God and see how powerful this is for us today. This is a message of victory. Amen. It's a message of victory. This is what I want you to understand about this. Sin leads to guilt. Guilt leads to fear. And fear leads to running from God. That's the way most people handle sin. They sin, they feel guilty, and they get afraid of God, and they run away from God. For the believer, there's no reason for you to do that. There's no reason for you to do that. And the reason why is this. Our guilt should lead us to confession and repentance. When we sin and we feel guilty about that sin, don't run away from God. Run to God. And get on your knees and say, God, I'm, this is what I did, and I'm sorry. And let's remember 1 John 1 9. Please let's remember that in verse 10. If we confess our sins, he's talking to believers. He, God, is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we don't have any sin, we make him a liar, his words not in us. In other words, what God's saying is, look, yeah, you're a sinner, you sin. And when you do sin, come to me. And if you come to me, I'll forgive you every time. You see why it's insanity for us not to go to God when we sin? And how many times do we not? You look through the pages of the Bible, people did it all the time. You know what got David into so much problems, King David? He sinned with Bathsheba. He murdered her, her husband. He continued to sin, and what did he do? He tried to hide it. And heartache after heartache after heartache. Until an old preacher stood in his face and said, David, you're the man who did this against God. And he wept bitterly, and he went to God. He said, cleanse me with this. Forgive me. Restore unto me the joy. You know why David didn't have joy? Because he wasn't fellowshipping with God. Because he let this sin get in between him and God. And he lost his joy. If you're struggling with joy today, you don't understand the love of God because you haven't been fellowshipping with God. And if you're a believer, you need to start fellowshipping. If you're not a believer, you need to come. Jesus Christ today. You know why? Because God put his love on display when Jesus died on the cross. You need to come to him. Verse 19 says this. We love because he first loved us. Isn't that amazing? When God showed up, he, he loved Adam so much, he went looking after him, didn't he? He loved Adam so much. And I'm telling you right now, God loves you so much that he's searching for you. He knows where you're at, but he's there saying, where are you at? You may be a believer and there may be sin in your life. 
and you keep trying to hide it from God, God knows about that sin. I'm telling you right now. He sees it, and He knows it, and He's waiting for you to come to Him because He loved you first. We didn't love God first. Not a single one of us. No human in history ever loved God first. God loved us first, so why would we run away from Him? If you're here and you're not a believer, God loved you first. He's making His love available to you today. And then the last point, this is a love that is devoted. Devoted. If anyone, look what he says in these last verses. If anyone says, I love God. Now I want you to hear this. Yet does what? Hates his brother. He is a what? For the person who does not love his brother he has seen cannot love the God he has not seen. And we have this command from him. The one who loves God must also love his brother. Don't tell me that you're in great fellowship with God if you're treating your brother like dirt. Or your sister. If you're gossiping about people, if you're holding grudges, if you're bullying people, if you're being mean to people, if you're just being a straight up jerk. And there's some Christians who pride themselves on being jerks. Some of the meanest, most some of the meanest, biggest jerks I've ever met claim to be Christ followers. Isn't that a shame? Anybody else ever have that experience? You know what they're saying? They don't spend any time with God because God is not there. Let's be a church that spends time with God until His love fills us to the brim where then any time we go up to somebody else like hey, Buck here, right? That I can't help it that the love of God just flows out of and then when Dwayne goes and visits with other people, they can't help but notice the love of God pouring out of them. If we become a church like that and struggle to stay like that, strive to stay like that, I guarantee you when people that are looking for love walk in this door, they're going to see it. They're going to say, that's what I've been looking for. And we'll have the opportunity to tell them where that kind of love comes from. You'll have so many opportunities to share the love of God. Let's Make sure we take it. Don't say you love God when you hate your brother. Because you're, you're a liar. That's what he's saying. Here's the good news. We have the capacity to love God and to love others with an agape love. We display. This is, this is the take home statement. I want you to take this home. We display God's love when we embrace it for forgiveness, are edified in fellowship, and extend it to others. We display God's love when we embrace it for forgiveness. When we have sin in our life and we feel guilty, we run to the forgiveness of God, not away from it. Amen? Our edified in fellowship, we spend more time with Him so His love fills us up, builds us up, and we then extend that love to others. That's what this chapter is telling us. That's why it's so important to understand the defined agape love of God and to be fully and completely filled with it so that we can share it with others. I hope that you'll remember this thing. I hope that you'll let it guide you in your life because that's what we're talking about and what we're really trying to understand in this chapter. If you're here today, we're going to stand. Our musicians are going to come forward. We're going to enter this time where we make a decision about what we've heard. If you're here today, and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want you to know, I want you to hear this, that extended, perfect love of God is made available to you today. You can trust in Him. He will love you. He will forgive you. He will make you new. If you're here today, and, I, and, I, and this is for every age, every person, if you say you love God and you've been treating people poorly, this is a time for you to repent of that sin, go to the forgiveness of God, and make a decision to start extending the love of God in your life. If you're here today and your life is, is filled with doubt and fear, this is the day where you go to God and you say, God, forgive me for doubting you. Forgive me for letting fear keep me away from you. I'm coming to you fully, God, and I ask that you'll forgive me. In 1 John 1, 9, you can take it to the bank. Jesus promises that he will forgive you. He promises that. If you're here today and you've been coming to church faithfully, but that's pretty much the whole sum of your Christian life, Today's the day to make a decision. I'm going to fellowship with God every day. 
I'm going to turn the TV off. I'm going to put the phone down. I'm going to get on my knees and pray, and I'm going to get in the Word and see what God says. This is an opportunity. If you're here and you're looking for a church and you need a church home, I'd be glad to talk to you about that. If you look around, there's decision cards. And, uh, you can fill that out. You can check the box that applies to you. You can write prayer requests on the back. If you need to write a detailed message to me, you can do that, and I'll look at that this week. This is an opportunity for you to make a decision about what you're doing. So as our band sings and plays, let's sing to our King, but let's be grateful for the love that He showed to us. And let's remember this message in 1 John chapter 2.